Sarah Hader is co-founder of Ex-Muslims of North America. She is an ex-Muslim herself. She is one of those people who I really do admire and respect out there in the arena of ideas. She just seems to be on the right side of this stuff so often and somehow manages to keep her cool. I don't know how this is possible because all of these conversations are almost always so heated and insane. How do you keep your cool? Actually, you know what, Sarah? The other day I saw you almost lose your cool. Yeah. And I was a witness. <laughs> yeah, I was talk about that? I mean, I what, you got hot under the collar about something. What happened? I mean, it was, um, we were, ex in North America was this past weekend, we were at, at the New York Pride. Um, it was part of this weekend. We have uh, this gathering of ex-Muslims once every year. We've had it for several years now. We call it GafferCon. And it's a very private thing. And this is the first time we were even publicly uh, telling anyone that we were we were having this because it's, it's just unique. Uh, it's exclusive to members of the organization. It's just a chance for ex-Muslims to comfortably you know, find support, meet each other. There's a lot of people only know each other from online, you know, across across the country. So this is a chance for everyone to come together. And we have all sorts of social gatherings throughout the weekend. Sometimes they last longer than that. I think this time we had like six, seven events throughout the weekend. So it's packed for everyone to just um, really just uh, build a community and a home and a family where they don't have it anywhere else. And this year we also went to Pride. Um, which was really exciting. And so we were just tweeting about that, sharing um, on, on Twitter, and I got several responses, the kind that I would, I, would, I would expect, right? People saying, oh, why are you doing this? Why are you, why do you even feel the need to, to, to have this organization? And this is the kind of response we get all the time. It usually comes from a place of ignorance. It's people who don't know the extreme stigma that ex-Muslims live in. Uh, they don't know about the um, the rights of ex-Muslims abroad and how they're, you know, we just don't, we're not considered human like everyone else. There's a death penalty for being an apostate in um, a dozen countries and then many more blasphemy is criminalized in many ways. So we're just, we're second, third, fourth, fifth class citizens. I mean, we're not even, you know, we don't have any real rights um, in those countries. And that comes across here as well in the West. These a lot of the, these immigrant communities they move here, but they that stigma of apostasy stays, and ex-Muslims go through all kinds of persecution, abuse, all sorts of things. So it it's shocking to me that anyone would find that you know that that our be surprised that our organization exists, and be surprised that we're finally fighting back um, against the ideology that persecutes us. So I, I almost lost it. I did kind of, I got, I got, I got really mad, which was not really w what, what I do it's most okay. of the time. Or at least I try, I, at least I try not to. Um, it was good yeah, to see yeah. a chink in the armor because yeah, usually I, you're pretty cool customers. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, I was sleep deprived and exhausted from the weekend, but I was also, I knew I just very, very recently because it just happened, but how important this was to people and how much it meant to them um, that we were there and, um, so it was, it was, it was just this, this, all this coming together and yeah, I, um, it's interesting I, I didn't said, respond. Oh, <laughs> forgive me for walking on you there, sir. Um, it's interesting. You said that, uh, how, you know, I can't believe people are surprised an organization like ours exists, which is an interesting way to say it. Uh, I was reading an article that I think that you guys had posted on Twitter about the rise of the atheist in Lebanon, I think of all places. Uh, mm -hmm. And all over the Muslim world. You see an underground of which is now starting to emerge. I know that every you know, nation, every Islamic theocracy is different, but you know, they're making videos about their journeys and they're yeah. being published online. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something is changing, and it's been changing in the past couple of years. And ex Muslims in North America, you know, we were. We have the, the privilege, but I think also the responsibility of being in a country where we're relatively safe compared to compared to anywhere else, really. And we have freedom of speech to a degree that even other Western countries don't have. So we we have these freedoms and I think we have this responsibility. Um, we've been able to be public and open for many years um, and build you know, an organization and build capacity to support some of these other groups. And now we're seeing uh, groups all over the world 
startup, uh, individual activists who are just doing it on their own. Um, but the idea of, of being an atheist in the Muslim world is just not, it's no longer what it was. Before it was just extreme phenomena. You could, you, nobody understood it. Nobody knew anything about it. But now it's so much more likely that you know an ex-Muslim um, or you've heard of them and you, you understood, you understand this phenomena in, on a different, in a different way. So it's kind of like we, we take, we borrow a lot of language from the gay rights movement because we think it's very applicable to us. Um, but we are coming out of the closet. Um, and I think just uh, just by by knowing other ex-Muslims and being exposed to other ex-Muslims, different people are they're, they're they're just standing up. They're finding the strength to stand up and to speak. So now in Muslim countries, I'm shocked all the time. Um, these people are so incredibly brave. You know, like I get scared in the United States sometimes when we have events and we have to have all the security and make sure that nothing happens because it could happen even here. Um, and then to see that there are people in Egypt. Um, you know, in, in, in Pakistan, all, all over the Muslim world where mob violence is truly, it's not even, it's, it, it's not a risk the way it is for us. It's almost an inevitability if you're, if you're open enough um, and you're exposed enough. So it's amazing to me to see that this is happening and this, this change is taking place in front of our eyes, really. So you talk a little bit about the mob. I'm going to make a, probably an awkward segue into discourse here in almost the year 2020, we're seeing a lot of the mob mentality. A lot of it originates online. The way people tend to sort of cordon off in their tribes and hurl invective at each other, and they really exist in a binary model, us versus them, in-group, out-group. You are either righteous or unrighteous. We're seeing this in factions of the atheist movement. We're seeing it in almost any place where you see diverse people come together. Have you, in your own circle, come to a point where you'd like to comment on that? I mean, you're involved in these sort of thick conversations, mm -hmm. you know, the death of, or at least the potential death of discourse in the age of the internet. Right. I've been so concerned about this for several years. It's only, it's, it's, th this is, this is a way in which I'm losing hope, right? So there's the rise of ex-Muslims and people, atheists from, from the Muslim world who are standing up and being courageous. That is, that is something that makes me feel so hopeful about the future of, of mankind. And then I'm seeing, uh, you know, the, so the inverse to some degree happen, but also just a general collapse of, of civil discourse in Western uh, society, but particularly among relatively educated people, you know, the kinds of people who go online, you know, the kinds of people who read, the kinds of people who are active and, and activists themselves. And I'm seeing a rising degree of intolerance for different opinions. I mean, it, it's, it's very understandable given the, given the effects of the internet. And I'm not the best first person to talk about this, but I'm sure you know stuff, just the, just the anonymizing factor that you're just talking to a screen and you're talking to, you know, a username, you're not talking to a person. It makes it so much easier to be cruel. But beyond that, um, there is this insidious, this insidious effect that I think Twitter allows and Facebook allows. Um, and it allows us to monitor our social environment. Um, and we, you know, we humans are always, we're always monitoring our social environment in order to see, okay, well, can I get away with saying this? Can I not get away with saying this? We're always, it, we always are running that calculus in our head and, and judging to see if the waters are cool enough to be open about something. But, the internet is doing something where it's allowing that that um, monitoring to happen um, at a more rapid rate and, and on a mass level. You can see what your whole community, what your whole circle is thinking and what's okay to say and what it isn't okay to say. And what that does is increase self-censorship um, because it, it, it allows, it, you know, you know what is okay to say, what isn't okay to say. So the average person is self-censoring in a way that they weren't self-censoring before because they couldn't. They just didn't know what the other person was thinking. They had no idea. Now they know. Um, and now they now they see witches, so-called, you know, like people who have transgressed, who have walked out of whatever invisible line that now, now exists. Um, they, ha they see those people punished. Um, we see them. We all see them um, because of the hyper-connectedness of our social circles. So there, this has, you know, all, all these little things come together to create an environment where we treat each other like crap, 
you know, we treat each other as if we're not human, we're, we're proto fascists, all of us. And it's, um, it's one of those things that I think, it, it, you know, it, it demoralizes me and it, and it makes me feel like, oh my goodness, how, how are we going to have, how are we going to have any conversation? If the person sitting next to you is always an enemy, especially if they disagree with you, then they're definitely an enemy. And what's the point of civil discourse anyway? What's the point of having conversations? What's the point of persuading people? You know, what's the point of rational, rational argumentation if the person that you're, you're trying to reach, you already consider, you already consider them an enemy. Talked about persuading people. One of the arguments that I hear is, is that you can't reason with unreasonable people. Of course, you're talking to someone who is reasoned out of an unreasonable faith. Uh, a lot of us were reasoned out of an unreasonable position. I'm a fan of Dia Khan. Are you familiar with Dia Khan's uh, mm-hmm, documentary, mm-hmm. White Right? I would love right. the chance to talk to her about sitting down in a living room with white supremacists face to face, right? Because they're mm-hmm. ready for the, you know, the confrontation in the public square where everybody's shouting and throwing things. They're ready for that. Mm-hmm. But when you see a person sit four feet from another human being and say, do you think I'm not a real person? Do you think I deserve to, you know, to be deported? And to watch many of these people in their hearts begin to just, you know, tilt. One guy had to stop the interview and mm-hmm. just like, I, I, I just can't talk. I, he, he just went tilt. He just couldn't deal with it. But mm-hmm. if you talk about having conversations, even with the worst among us, meaning those who hold the worst ideas, this is unthinkable. You cannot yep. reason with, I don't know, Nazis or whoever. Mm-hmm. What's your take, Sarah Hader? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's surprising to me to see, I mean, I don't know how surprising it is for you, but it's surprising for me to see this attitude come in from secular people, from like, from the atheist community, from the skeptic community, because as you said, so many of us were reasoned out of unreasonable ideas, and some of us were extremists, you know, I mean, I, I, I re- regularly, I work with, interact with, um, ex-Muslims, sometimes prominent ex-Muslims, sometimes ex-Muslims who really, like, now they're, they're activists and they're changing the world, who used to be, like, insane, like, conservative, I want the caliphate to come back kind of people. And they were reasoned out of it. And given that we, in the atheist community especially, we know these people, we know formerly fundamentalist people, and we've seen how, how radically just persuasion you know can change someone's mind how why would we doubt this in the case of you know political differences um in the case of extremists like like the far right or even the far left can i can we park there for just a second i i want to you have dealt with people who were capable of murderous violence in the name of their faith Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, when you say extremist, we're not just being hyperbolic. You've no. encountered people who were who ep- epitomize what ISIS epitomizes at one time in their lives. Is that what you're saying? Or, or supported or supported what ISIS was doing. I mean, there there are people, ex-Muslims who 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 were like that and who admit to being like that, who are now ex-Muslims themselves, and they they openly talk about how a couple of years ago, before before they left the faith, they would have advocated for the death penalty for people like us and the kind of person they are now. I mean, that kind of radical change can happen, and I don't understand. I mean, what's confusing to me is to see. Uh, that kind of tendency that you just mentioned of, um, of, of not understanding that people, of course, even the most, uh, even the most fundamentalist, some of the most out there, some of the most extreme violent people um, can be, can be convinced, can be spoken to, can be, can be persuaded um, uh, into, into changing their minds. I don't know. I don't understand why this is considered Um, like my position is considered naive when we have proof. We know it's happened. It happens all the time. Atheists especially know that it happens. You know what? Only a proto-fascist would say that. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I've I've been reading the comments too long. It was just a reflex. It just flies out of my mouth. You took some heat after uh, sort of a, I don't know if it was a condemnation, certainly a criticism of the West in regard to compulsory hijab. This was an article that had been published, I don't know, a month, uh, probably a month and a half or so ago. And you were pretty hard on Western progressives 
in regard to the hijab. And so I'll, I'll just let you sort of take that wherever you want. The point of the article and your response to the criticisms. Or in, in fact, what were the criticisms? Okay. Well, I, th- I think that you're, you're talking about an interview that happened. A yeah, couple yeah. Of, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Um, so it, lots of things were covered and, and hijab was one of them. And, uh, you know, before I go on at length about how I feel about the hijab, let me just say, I understand that this is my, I understand that sometimes things are difficult and complicated and the average person won't necessarily know what the best tactic is to take. And I, I see that as being my role as an activist to come and to speak to people and to show them why, you know, maybe their approach to the act to, to this particular um, aspect um, is, is not okay or is, you know, problematic or is something that will lead to some harmful effect in the future. So I see that as being my role and I understand that. Uh, I understand that as being part of the process. Um, however, the, you know, it it, it is um, frustrating to get the kinds of pushback that I'm getting sometimes when I discuss the hijab. Um, I understand that there are some women who wear it out of choice. Um, I put on the hijab myself when I was in middle school. I was quite young <laughs> and I didn't really know what I was doing, uh, but I you know, I wasn't forced. Nobody in my family were like my, my, my mom by that. I mean, my mom didn't wear the hijab and she never um, pushed me into wearing it or anything like that. But I put it on, um, not for very, very long, but I did, I did put it on and I wore, you know, on my own, but by choice, you know, what, to, what whatever choice means in this context. Um, and I felt empowered by it. And I felt like, you know, given my faith, given what I believe, this was the right thing to do. That's what I thought. Um, so the choice discussion is, you know, it like let's set that aside for just a little bit. Uh, regardless of whether or not something is a choice, a woman can choose to 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 advocate on behalf of something that ends up being quite sexist, you know, or even misogynist. And you know that I think is it has to be separated from the from the choice discussion um, because that is more complicated and less complicated depending on what you're talking about. Um, in the case of in the case of what the hijab means, it matters that the religion considers it as part of a set of compulsory dress codes on women and on men, um, and you know that, that that aspect of the dress code is very gendered and it's gendered for a reason. There's a certain consideration what the female body is and how it leads to sin and 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 what it can do to destroy you know the morality of a people. So this has to be a part of the discussion. We have to we can't just say that you know none of this matters. This this entire historical context of what the hijab has been and still is in the majority of the world is just not relevant because you know some privileged women in the, in the in the west some privileged muslim women choose to wear it right so they choose to wear it and that's the end of it but of course that's not the end of it we know that there are so many countries and around the world where women are forced there are many many communities where even if they're not forced you know by the law they're they're strongly <laughs> encouraged, you know, forced, in other words, by religious communities to cover and they start covering when they're eight, they're, you know, seven sometimes, very, very young. Um, and they're not really given any choice to be any other way by their parents. And we know that we know that this exists and that context matters. And that's important to talk about. And it's it, to the extent that I see it when we're talking about the, you know, the first hijabi to do X, you know, the, the, there'll be news articles about celebrating this wonderful thing. We, ha- we ca- it can't just be an afterthought. This entire religious context of why this thing exists and what it means can't be an afterthought. afterthought. I was thinking too, you know, when I was talking about it, and this is a two-part question, but, you know, I, my position was, you know, no one should ever tell someone else what to wear. At the same time, as long as it's used as a tool by Islamic theocracies, etc., for control mm-hmm. and dehumanization. Let's not put it on freaking Cosmo, right? Yeah. Let's, let's not say we're going to tell you what to wear, but, but until this is not a tool of oppression and dehumanization, let's not prop it up as a celebrated symbol. I thought that yeah. was basic. Right. And I was surrounded by many of my fellow liberals who 
who thought I was trying to tell someone else what to wear or that I should disqualify myself from a human rights discussion because I'm the wrong color, because I'm from the West, because I'm male, uh, et cetera, all of these disqualifiers in place. Um, I don't know. I, you want to speak to any of that, you know, the celebration of the hijab? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much that you said that I think we could just go on about for a long time. But, I mean, I, I can't imagine that we would treat – you know, um, the, the dress code of the, the, the fundamentalist Mormon women, you know, they're wearing these long dresses and they're covering up their head a little bit and they have these like old fashioned hair shells. We w- I don't think we would celebrate that in the same way that we celebrate the, the hijab. We would understand there that there's a context and that even if a grown adult woman, you know, chooses whatever that means again, uh, to put it on, um, that there is, that there is an entire community in which she has she has been uh, brought up, and there's a set of values and norms that she has adopted, partially because she was raised to be that way, and she doesn't really know any other any other way. Um, and we understand that as a context. And even if, let's say, somebody converts to fundamentalist Mormonism or whatever, and decides to put it on, we still would feel uncomfortable with that kind of extreme dress. Um, on the cover of Cosmo. We would still feel like there's something that's not quite right here. And maybe there's something here that we, we should just be careful. And then we should find ways to celebrate the choice of minorities and the religious freedom of minorities without glorifying certain aspects of it. And I don't think they think that that's what they're doing. And this is where the carelessness comes in. That That's honestly more offensive to me than, than, and than anything else. Uh, that they're just sort of slapping it on and and not really giving it too much too much thought um uh, we say and, they uh, they wear it like you might wear an, an awareness ribbon you know you put it right. on your lapel it's oh right. you know, but, but yeah they, it's like try a hijab day right like you just put it on and you're like oh how interesting and different culture i feel so educated <laughs> um and that's so i don't know i just don't know how to react to that i mean you have to be so ignorant and you have to just you have to just set aside the suffering of hundreds of millions of women um, in order to be in and, and the forced modesty that they have to undergo their whole lives in order to feel like this is just this fun, fashionable, ethnic, cultural, like ambiguous thing that we just put on and we celebrate and then we feel, feel good about ourselves because we're so accepting. I'm interested in these purity tests where people can't advocate for someone else unless they are X or unless they aren't why. I'm reminded of the story of Rahaf Muhammad when she was trying to escape the uh, Bangkok airport. She's barricaded in the room. She's on Twitter. She's live streaming. Please, they're coming for me. They've threatened to kill me. And um, I remember, you know, when I was out there with so many other people, we're all sharing the story and the story goes viral and she is rescued and given asylum in Australia or in Canada rather. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember thinking to myself, you know, whenever she, if she ever stumbled across the share by myself, an ex-Christian, not an ex-Muslim, born in Oklahoma in the United States, and she saw me advocating for her, I can't imagine she would be like, ah, shit, he's white, or he's Mm. male, or he's not Mm. an ex-Muslim. And yet, I am told constantly that I have to be X or not be Y to be able to support someone else. This makes no sense. Like, I can't mm. march with my best friend in a pride parade because I'm hetero. I, I, right. Where do right. these <laughs> things come from? And I'm sure you've experienced them as well, right? Right. And they've, they've gotten worse, right? I remember a couple of years ago when I started first started hearing this kind of language and I was – you know, sort of, and I started saying, I don't know about this. I don't know if this makes sense that you have to be the exact race, ethnicity, whatever, uh, in order to discuss certain issues. Um, you know, and whatever, I remember when I first brought it up, people said, these are just extremists. This is just, these are just wacky Tumblr teenagers. And you just, you need to forget about them and move on to the real problems and discuss the real problems. Except this kind of thinking has taken over you know, it, like, I, I wouldn't say, okay, maybe taking over is a strong word, but um, truly become normalized in our discourse, especially in activist circles and progressive activist circles, especially that you have to come from a certain set, you have to belong from, a, you have to come from a certain experience and able to, in, in order to, in order to even participate in the d- discussion, 
right? There's certain things that you're not even allowed to have an opinion on. I'm not even allowed to have an opinion on. Um, like I can't what? I can't advocate for issues relating to gender equality because right. I'm, I'm a man. I thought that was the point. I thought we, we are all supposed to be advocating for each other to erase those inequalities. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm endlessly frustrated by this issue and by, by the way that we use our, um, you know, the, the, the factors that we can't change about ourselves as a form of, you know, qualifier for whether or not you're allowed to participate in a certain discussion. It's very lazy. It's, and it's, um, in a very fundamental level, it's anti-liberal, you know, it's the opposite of, of, of the, the, you know, the fundamental idea that makes up, um, liberal society and that, it, which is that we have the capacity to speak to each other and we have the capacity to become, to, to change other's minds, to make coalitions, to work together for a better future. But the only way you can have that is, is if you, if you uh, understand that there's a common humanity and there's an ability to empathize and an ability to sympathize and an ability to understand deeply, sometimes you know, best of all, situations that you're not necessarily a part of. Um, and again, if you if you let this go, this concept go, then what are we left with? If you can't participate in certain conversations, I can't participate in certain conversations unless I belong to that uh, specific ethnic group, then we're just all uh, cloistered in our little bubbles um, of people who have the same skin color and gender and whatever, what have you. Um, and, and we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to, you know, participate in, in dialogue together and, and work together as a coalition. I don't I mean, it's just really destructive. Beat the yeah. dead horse here. Have you gotten involved in the milkshaking discussions at all? No, no, you haven't. no, no. And I haven't th really, I haven't really thought about it very much. I don't, yeah. Wow. Um, I heard it's, about it, yeah. It's much of the same kind of stuff, you know, where you go out and you throw, uh, apparently we throw, you know, custard at awful people and this is supposed to solve something. And, and so I, I just think this is, this is not helpful. It's <laughs> and, not. And it's, people, it's, it's an exercise in feeling good about yourself. That's what it is. It's the angry people who are, okay, they're rightfully angry and upset, right? A lot of people are, are upset at what's, what's happening in the world around us. They're scared. Um, and they want to do something and they feel like the normal, the normal processes are slow and they're frustrating, or maybe they no longer believe that they work. So they just want to do something. Um, but so often, you know, so often what we end up doing is just an exercise in, in, uh, inventing our own feelings. And much of the time it actually has a, you know, um, it, it actually, harms whatever cause that we're trying to fight for if you like that like antifa etc i mean they are what they say they despise this sort of mob right. rule this burn it all down sort of moral or not moral but uh, well perhaps moral but just sort of an uh, an anarchy i i just resist extremism and somehow this is a controversial point of view in almost the year 2020 i just don't think extremism is how we solve today's problems and but in the twitterverse i don't I don't see uh, the, anybody de-escalating, very few people de-escalating these days. So, I think it comes from a, especially a place of ignorance. A lot of people there, I mean, you see, you see Antifa and the far right, and I'm not, equi I'm not equivocating. I know that they're different. And I, I, I personally think that the far, le far right is a far, far, far greater threat. Um, and I understand that. I mean, they've actually, they've actually killed people. You know, it's, 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 it's different. But that's not to say that we shouldn't be worried about the extremists on the far left. Um, and I do think, I mean, if you look at the makeup of a lot of these people, they're young, they're often they're white men, right? I mean, especially Antifa, it's, yeah. it's, it's white men. That's what it is. Um, but there are people who have never seen uh, the decay of civil discourse. They've never been in a society where violence is the rule. You know, it's not the exception. It, you don't make your point through violence. You run from violence because it is everywhere and it is impossible to hide from and keep yourself safe from. And they don't understand that the, if you allow our civil discourse to decay to the point that violence in any form becomes normalized, then inevitably the people that will be at the top of that hierarchy will not be the people who are 
most interesting, most convincing, most uh, talented. Um, it will be the people who are best at utilizing violence to their advantage. It's going to be the thugs and the 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 actual the, the most brutal, cool people in our society that are going to take advantage of such a situation. I just don't think we're going to hate ourselves into a better future. I, I call me naive. Uh, we're on the clock here with Sarah. She's got a few minutes left. I've got a call on the switchboard. Let's make it fast. Three one six. You're on with the Thinking Atheist podcast. Seth Andrews, Sarah Hader, who's this? Hey, this is David from Holland. David, thanks for calling. Do you have a question or comment for Sarah? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Sarah. Good evening. It's hi. evening here in Holland. Um, as an ex-Muslim, wouldn't you say, as repugnant as it may seem, that, uh, that extremists or fundamentalists are the true Muslims? Uh, since they take the text literally from the Quran and live by it, um, in a way, there can't be a moderate Islam, can there? That was my question. Okay. And can there be a moderate Islam, is what you're saying. Um, I think, yeah. Sure. Yeah. is this question, the extremists are actually holding to the literal text of the Quran and are acting the true Islam sort of thing. Was that your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a former Catholic, um, and uh, f from what I know, uh, that Christianity doesn't have fundamentalists on the same scale as Muslims have. Right. You know? mm -hmm. So both these things are true in that, um, one, there is a difference between Christianity and Islam and Christianity and Judaism, and that matters. Those differences matter, and they're often... The differences are deep. They're they're based in the scripture, and um, and that has effects um, echoes throughout Muslim practice. And um, the history of Islam is different in that, and it looks very different than Christianity. Christianity was weak in its beginning. Um, uh, Islam had a lot of successes right at the beginning, and Muhammad was a politician and a statesman, um, as well as a religious leader. And so that impacts the way Islam, you know, thinks of itself and, uh, and the place that it has in society and the fact that it had in, his, in history so many great successes um, until they finally, they, they slowed down um, after, after a long time and, a lo you know, a lot of great con conquests. Um, so that history also impacts the way that, uh, Muslim theologians and Muslim, you know, if, if you go back to you know, legal um, interpretations of Muslim law, of, of the Sharia, um, you'll see that reflected in it. And so, there's, yes, there's differences, and we shouldn't be naive um, and discount them. And I hear a lot of all religions are, our religions are the same. They're equally bad or they're equally good. Well, that's not true. They're different. Um, they're different, and in some ways Islam might be better, but in some ways it's going to be um, a it's going to pose greater challenges, or at least um, temporarily more difficult challenges. Um, so that is true, and I get frustrated that when people refuse to grapple with this reality. Uh, having said that. Can Islam be moderated? I think so, of course, because Islam, because Muslims are humans just like everyone else. They're living in this modern world. They have the same pressures of the modern world that everyone else is going through. They have the same desires um, as everyone else, um, and they are going to be impacted by um, the by, by the growing understanding we have of the world, just like anyone else. So as long as they become more aware. Um, and I think that religions in general have an endless capacity to fool themselves, right? And religious people, like I think to some degree, you kind of have to play a dance and when you are a religious person and ignore a good deal of, 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 of what's going on. So I think Muslims can, Muslims can con confuse themselves and become a little bit more moderate. And I think to some degree, we've seen that happen in Christianity when some Christians uh, advocate for gay rights, you know, and they're more accepting than they have been ever before. Um, these are historically not Christian things, but they've become Christian things. Um, and I think a similar thing can happen to Islam. But I'm, you know, uh, I'm betting on on the rise of atheism to do a lot of the a lot of that moderating work as well. Appreciate your call very much, sir. Thanks so much. Yep. Bye. All right. Take care. I would spend longer on the call, but 
We're pushing the clock. I know you have to jet here in about two minutes. Give me some good news, Sarah. I mean, talk about the the work you're doing with ex-Muslims of North America or elsewhere. We can talk about this recent event. You had this big uh, uh, ex-Muslim event, whatever. Just let us know uh, what's happening and then how we can help support you and your work. Okay. Yeah. um, So lots of good things are in the works with ex-Muslims of North America. Please follow our website or our social media and we'll try and keep everyone up to date. Um, This next coming year, we want to be more public and more open. And so we're excited to do that. And we have a lot of initiatives coming up to have more more videos, more open conferences and events so that other people can join. I'm working on an event that's slightly that's separate um, uh, from from this work, but it is very related. Um, it is an, an, a conference, a one day conference in New York that's coming up. It's called uh, When Rights and Religions Collide. Um, we have a website and you can you can look us up and it's um, going to be a a discussion and, and an in-depth look into the all the different ways that uh in uh, sorry, um, secluded religious and isolated religious communities uh, can uh, be, you know can harm or or take away from the rights of the their members and particularly their most vulnerable members. So we're that's what we're going to be that's what we're going to be thinking about in the conference, and that's what the speakers are going to talk about. The now, this that's collision. That's not limited to Islam. Is it just a no. general broad topic? Yeah, it's a broad, it's it's a broader conference, and my co co organizers, I'm uh, I'm I'm organizing it together with these these two amazing women, um, and we've been working on it for a couple of month uh, months. Um, one of them is the founder of uh, the this uh, Amish Heritage Foundation, which is the the I think first organization maybe. Um, of of people who are leaving the Amish lifestyle behind, so she works with with that group, and um, another the other woman uh, that is working uh, w- with me, it works with. Uh, she, I think she was a founder of an organization called Footsteps, and they assist Hasidic um, or Orthodox Jews. Um, who are leaving their faith community behind. So um, the three of us came together. We found that our communities have similar issues. And we also found that the broader the broader world struggles to understand um, what exactly is happening, in, especially when it comes to the infringement of, of individual rights and liberties within these secluded and isolated communities. So we wanted to have a conference where we can just discuss this at large um, and take into all the different all the different things that come into play to make that happen, you know, from a from a from a sociological perspective, but also legally, you know, what we can do to assist academics who are thinking about these issues, um, but also um, service providers who might be um, who might be interacting with uh, groups of people that come from from this background. I love the stories of ex-religious people yeah i just love them and i'm curious to see if you know they were indeed reasoned often extremist religious people reasoned out of their faith um i know a great many of us were so um go meet your obligations i know you've been very generous with your time i'd love a chance to sit down and do this when we aren't really on the clock because you're such a good guest but i will make sure to point everybody to uh, your site i got your twitter handle we'll get ex-muslims Uh, website in the description box and uh, we'll see you out there thanks for all of your amazing work (laughs) thank you for having me on Seth you bet